Nu kastar vi oss snabbt över Kastis, eh, kulturarv och spelteknologi i Skaraborg. Det är Lisa Holloway som är biträdande professor med estetik och berättande vid högskolan i Skövde. Välkommen Lisa. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm going to present in English. I hope that's okay. Yeah. And um, yes, so as you just learned, I, I'm from the University of Huerta, uh, where I'm an associate professor. I work in a subject area called media arts, aesthetics and narration, which I think is important um, to, to explain just very briefly, um, because even though some of the work I'll show today for the project, the Castus project, which in English is cultural heritage and game technologies in Scarborg, uh, that I, I do a lot of research around all kinds of media that are not necessarily even digital media. And I, so I work across uh, literature, film, uh, you know, books, performance, all kinds of things. Um, but I do focus on interaction and I focus on how the, um, the sociocultural impacts of technology. And that's part of where my role, I run a research group called the Game Research Group, um, but that it um, moves across games, art, media experience. We have all of these combined together. So when we think of games or we think of um, uh, technologies like VR, AR, all of these together, um, we're thinking of them as complex media objects and considering the ways in which they, um, you know, they are impacted by visitors or users in the experience, particularly within that. So I'm going to talk about the Castus project for sure, but I'm going to talk about a sub project within that primarily, which is called the club project, then I'll explain how that works. Um, and I'm going to just start actually with a little bit of background. Um, uh, is, so this is the project. I'll come back to the project and show you some examples, of course, from the project. But I'm going to ground a little bit of information here to say that the you know the project actually began um, with funding from the municipal, the Scarborough municipal authorities, um, and has then also received more funding from the Vestra Yetalans region, uh, where um, that to support some of the activities within that. And it's operated within two different phases. So we started in 2015 to 2018, but because of the success of the project and the ways in which we were um, meeting some of our aims and goals, we got additional funding that continues now through the end of 2021, which is awesome. <laughs> and really the aim was to um, consider how, you know, technology platforms can support, um, you know, cooperation among cultural stakeholders in the region, a range of different kinds of folks, um, and also of course, create knowledge that not just knowledge about the cultural heritage, but knowledge about the technologies that are used um, and different ways that we can really work collaboratively together to do that. So through series of seminars, workshops and all kinds of demonstrators and so on. So um, the initial aim was to work on three digital narration platforms. So that was in museums, but also on cultural heritage sites, but also to explore particularly this idea of transmedia storytelling, that storytelling across a, you know, a number of different platforms. And some of those platforms are not necessarily digital platforms, as you'll see. Um, and um, the aim with the kind of the newer work was to continue to focus on integration um, and how we can cooperatively come up with a model for thinking about that. Um, so that's the kind of grounding and funding for the project. And I work primarily as the research leader within that. And the project leader is Lars Vipo, my colleague who does amazing work um, pulling the bits and pieces, as you'll see, it's a kind of a grand <laughs> project from a small Hoogskola in a small subregion within Sweden. So on the scale of the other work that I think I've seen this morning, um, this question of you know how, how scalable or how, how kind of downsized can you begin, um, that's one of the things that we deal with is how can we create a kind of a model for cooperation and to use technology, but still make it quite accessible and not costly and overly expensive. And how can we gather our sort of labor together in that way? So maybe you'll see um, some more examples of that. And just to point out really quickly for those of you who um, don't know, Again, Skarborg is an older subregion within the larger region of the Vestra Yutalans, and I'll come back to that. Um, you can see, you know, Huvda is up <laughs> in the middle 
um, a little bit within the scoreboard, the yellow region there. But I just, again, a little context for how we work. Again, I'm coming from a university perspective, and uh, I want to point out that we have a very large games education at the University of Bogota. It's one of the largest in Northern Europe with a, a degree granting. So we have over 500 students in a range of different degree programs that range from the more artistic and cultural writing sound, music graphics, to programming and design and other issues. And we even have a very special program uh, a master's program called Digital Narration, Cultural Heritage and Game Technologies. And I work a lot within that program and with master's students where we work with museum partners and other kinds of cultural folks um, and schools and uh, in different capacities to help students who are doing their research and thesis work, figure out what this very special configuration of working with museums for technology and how games and games is defined very broadly. Um, sometimes it's interactive media of all kinds can support that. Um, and so we have a lot of um, faculty and research working within that. And we recognize, we draw very much on the idea of interdisciplinary interests, again, from the cultural to the technical. Uh, we often talk about the fact that it's not the technology <laughs> necessarily that needs the development, it's the, it's the knowledge around the technology and how it impacts culture. Um, so you'll see examples of that. And again, we co-creation is at the core of our work. So we want to work in partnership with participants. You know, we're not necessarily, um, as a, you know, in another business model, um, you know, hired to come in and do something specific. It's about very iterative design processes on small scales, on bigger scales, with a range of different kinds of people. Um, and I gave you a quote from Nina Simons, the participatory museum there, um, to say that, you know, our aim is really to be responsive to the needs of local community members and to understand it's not one size fits all. There are several, there are 15 municipalities within our subregion. And each of them has different needs and expectations. And we're trying to create a system for dialogue and for engagement and to think about how the design process can, can work in a number of different levels. Um, so that's um, important to know. And again, it's back um, just to give you, I, I just have a few more slides sort of on the, the background context of this. But again, recognizing as you all know who <laughs> work in museums that, um, you know, that museums, are, you know, become kind of identity makers. They have different personalities per se, and they have different needs. And it's a blend of thinking about the material and the immaterial, um, that, you know, that comes together and kind of participation. So a lot of that work with rethinking what an institution of a museum is from a research standpoint, or technology even entered the picture. And now that's created a much more kind of complex uh, world that we investigate. So um, we're influenced by um, terms like the post-digital museum and just simply all that means is that now in many museums the digital is normative. We expect to, to confront some kind of digital, whether it's our website, whether it's just a simple kiosk, whether we have just some kind of a technology that might be an audio experience or something within the museum, the technologies are there. And the technologies haven't actually changed that much. They, they, they do come into use and of course they flow in and out, but that it's not the technology that's the focus, it's the storytelling. Um, so we wanted to work on projects that were about how can we create storytelling experiences and how can we focus on, yes, the technology is significant and important, but how can we keep it accessible and how can we keep it small, but test the limits of how we can create a kind of a storytelling um, platform. The, so, so it's a lot about the content and the ways in which we engage with that and how we also think of then again about moving outside the walls of the museum because we want to create um, um, audience-centered uh, experiences. Not we're, we're not necessarily giving technology to them. We want them to sort of be very involved um, in the process along with that. And again, I would just say that um, serious games or games that are in museum or in other cultural heritage spaces have now been around for, you know, quite some time, a decade and a half plus, sometimes two decades, if you think about how, whatever, how you define a game. Um, and I just draw on this research um, just for a, a minute to say that, you know, games or gamification methods um, with technologies can be used and they have been used in a number of different ways to promote cultural awareness or to create reconstructions 
um, or just about heritage awareness that might come from more intangible cultural heritage. And I think you've seen some examples of that today, but we really um, are trying to investigate then the affective domain, which just means how, how do users feel about <laughs> and experience these and create kind of empathetic connections. I mean, I think we saw that the lovely um, dinosaur exhibition this morning that of course is about creating wonder and it's big, but it's also understanding, you know, how, how empowering it is to, you know, experience technology in this kind of new kind of way that lets you confront something that you might not otherwise see. So now some just examples from the um, technology itself. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my time here. Um, so as I said, we're in the Skarborg um, region in Sweden, which is this subregion here. Hovde is, is in this place. Um, there are, uh, we have 15 municipalities and museums in each of those and other collaborative partners that we've worked with. And um, it's a very old, you know, there's a lot of old <laughs> Swedish history um, that is both um, based on heritage sites, but also a lot of it is to do with like folk tales and thinking about other kinds of ways in which you can um, think about these kind of fictional imaginative creatures and and some of them are very specific to the to the very specific municipalities or might be in one village or uh, attached to one lake or something like that. So we really wanted to capture the kind of the micro folk tale um, identities within that. So our aim was really to uh, from the beginning to think about how can we create a kind of a world building exercise here? How can we take the region and turn it into a storytelling platform that draws on, again, the, the, some of the small elements um, that are present within each of the municipalities and the kinds of histories and stories that you might not even know from one municipality to another? And of course, how can we engage children um, and families into that? Because that's the other uh, subcomponent. This is very specifically a project about children um, and their um, you know, caretakers in some point being able to find an accessible history. Um, so what we did then is we started th through a process I don't have time to explain, but we really worked with the idea of um, creating a mixed media, transmedial storytelling. So we decided through a process <laughs> that we ended up with the idea that each of the municipalities would have a children's book that was specifically designed about cultural heritage um, in that specific region, but, um, and, and we would follow, we have a frame narrative that I'll tell you about in a second, um, that, that, so the story continues through each of the regions and it's developed in real time. So they don't all come out together. They come out over a period of time. And we're, in fact, we're just now putting out the last one within the region, but they're focused on um, a children's book series, but that also has an augmented reality application within it. And the augmented reality is, is actually, Quite simple. We, it was developed with one of our partner organizations who are actually former game students of ours who developed the AR platform, but with just the idea being that each of the books has scannable AR components within it um, that you can scan on your mobile phone. You can find and discover certain creatures and characters that belong to the folktale, um, collect them in your phone, very similar to the way that something like a Pokemon Go would work, and then you um, uh, and then again, you can learn more about the characters in the application and the characters travel from book to book to book or some of the characters do, but new ones are introduced along the way. And club stands for Kira and Lupa's bestiarium. Uh, Kira and Lupa are those two main characters that you see there that's a vampire girl and a werewolf boy. Um, and they are chasing this evil circus director that you can see in the pop-up AR image from museum to museum across the, the landscape and encountering new creatures as they go, trying to release them from this circus that the evil circus director has, has made them perform in. But it was one way of, so we can travel the region, we can keep introducing new characters, um, and we can even keep introducing um, through the process of the years of development, new spaces so that for example, um, later after the book series and in tandem with some of them still being developed, we, for example, place signs on the landscape that also can be scanned. The special characters that appear in the books, you can travel, for example, here to the stone ship and you can see King Rana who 
pops up um, from the signage. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's simple, it doesn't do much more. Some of them wave, some of them just, you can spin them around, um, but it creates a kind of curiosity and we hope inspires, and we know inspires families to go from place to place. So the very first book was set the scene for this troll researcher who is um, trying to help Kira and Lupa um, track down the circus director as they move from place to place and um, um, follow the, the storyline along. You can see in the uh, the top of the page the C for the circus director, which becomes the kind of the the um, the, the the letter, the AR image, the trigger image for the AR application that comes um, as he there pops up um, from the book. But the characters over the course of the um, experience, we, we, we have collaborated in other ways so that it's not just the book series. Over time, we have done museum exhibitions where these characters or these letters are placed within certain exhibition sites at the local museums, the regional museums. Kids get to know the characters. They then go to the museum. They get another new experience, a new pop-up figure that they can have. Or um, we use um, oftentimes even um, artifacts from the museum that are featured in the children's books. But then when you go to the museum, you can find you know, the special jar or the special map, or you can stand with a, take a selfie with the circus director in, in some kind of other place. So we're continuing to layer the worlds and build them um, without necessarily changing the technology that much, but changing the experience and the context in which you present them. So that even with a traditional book exhibition, such as this one that happened in 2020, where we create sort of life-size version of the book. At this point, five years in, many kids know what the books are, how they work. This was in a museum um, here in Hovda, where you can go find the books on large scale, but then you can do a different kind of scavenger hunt. That's just, and this is just material, finding uh, clues and moving through the exhibition spaces. But at the end, you can then either buy the books or play with the books or find out more stuff about the, uh, um, the museums and the characters within the museums and how they change. So it's, you know, we keep, you know, layering these experiences. And of course, working, as I said, with these even outdoor um, exhibitions and more signage. And then more recently, um, again, I hear people talking about the pandemic and how that has affected. Um, one of the ways we were able to use the kind of pandemic as a backdrop to say, oh, but maybe families can still go out and visit some of these sites on their own, it was inspirational for thinking about how to create an actual guidebook around the Scarboard region, um, a guidebook, meaning there were 14 places that were selected around the region that some of them are attached directly to museums. And um, kids and families could travel to the museum where they can scan, again, just a simple QR code, um, but that, that would download an audio version of the books. And that, so they were inspired to, to you know, keep finding the technology, but in this case, it's an audio book. So maybe they've read it, but we were partnered with another organization called Media Poolin, who um, took the paper, you know, traditional books, and then also through, you know, voice acting and so on, turn them into audio books. So you could collect them, again, coming to the signs, um, and not all of them are at museum sites. But, and then this is the last book that we just finished, um, that again, introduced these new figures called the Milk, milk hares who are special magical <laughs> creatures who are transformed to become hybrids of different kinds of characters. Um, and this was a, a follow-up of other projects that we've created where we've used, tried to introduce the, the milk hares into other kinds of environments in some ways. And then it's sort of summarized in this um, last um, book, but even inspired us, for example, to make a board game um, this has been a process that's happened over two years that started as a small, um, it was actually a thesis, an exam project for one of our master's students. Could you transform the club book series into just a, a board game without the technology um, that was based on finding different cards and creatures, there are beasts and then there are treasures, but it, it's, it's an educational game to learn about the museum um, and that is, is meant to be a pedagogical activity that can be played in museums um, and then can also lead us, you know, again, back to the books and to the AR applications. But in this case, there is no technology involved in it. We could have done that. Um, and just to give you a list of then, at, at this point, we've tried to count, but I would say there's over a hundred different 
easily over 100 different people we've partnered with. The students, uh, some of the, our students become authors of the book or they're the artists in the book or the technology developer, but they're also developing research around how museums and <laughs> technology and games come together and they're generating that as part of their thesis projects. So this is just from an example from um, some that we've collected from the beginning of the project. But there are many more who've actually gone on to work in museums and have partnered in other kinds of um, projects, creating different technologies, um, some that are more sophisticated, some that are VR and 3D and so on, but that are inspired um, specifically.